today, not only to worship the Lord, but to do that as well. And uh, we want to honor our mothers today. And uh, we praise the Lord for everything that he's blessed us with in our mothers. And uh, I hope that you've called your mother if she's living. I hope that you've contacted her. I hope that you've honored your wife, the wife mother of your children, if she's living. And uh, I hope that you remember your mother if she's not living. And uh, thank God for her. Sister Rachel is going to speak to us today, and I want to turn this over to her, and I know that she has a good word from the Lord, and I'm excited to hear what God has to say to me and to all of us today. Yes. Praise the Lord, Sister Rachel. God bless you.
Jesus' name on every one of us that have a heart to receive it. But I also pray that Sister Rachel will be as your holy oracle right now. Speak to us. We need to hear from your word. Speak through her and anoint her as your word is already anointed. Bring it to life in us. In Jesus' name, that your will be done. Amen. Amen. So if you'd like to turn to your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 16, and I apologize, Lily, I did not give you the verses I was even thinking about. I needed to do that, and then it just left my brain. So, sorry about that. Deuteronomy chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 1 through 3. And it says, Observe the month of Abib, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread, therewith even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. You may be seated. Well, since this is Mother's Day, I have to make one reference um, to my mom and ask y'all a question. Do you have anything that you do, have done, still do, um, that you don't really know why you do it, did it, but it's just what your mom always did or what your family always did? Any of you have things like that? Like, um, like we always um, have ham a certain way. We always have ham on Christmas. Like, that's just what you're supposed to do. My mom always spreads brown sugar, and she does pineapple slices, and she always pours a can of Coke over. I'm not really for sure why. I just thought that's how you make ham. And so maybe the once or two times I made ham, I, I did that. I'm not, I'm not the cook in the family. <laughs> um, or things like cleaning. My mom used to always, when she did spring cleaning, she would get um, a bucket of, she would mix ammonia and water. I did that for a few years. I don't do it anymore. I don't know that it's really that healthy or safe. I don't know. <laughs> but I know our, our house would smell very strong of that smell, but it was how she did her spring cleaning. She might on the walls. Um, how she did bee stings. Do you guys, I don't know if you guys have your own thing. If we got a bee sting, it was grab the baking soda and the water, make a paste. I don't really know the science behind it. That's what I've done for my kids. But it's just, that's what my mom did. So that's what I do. So that can be good and that can be bad. But um, the Passover that we just kind of that we just read about um, was kind of like that for the children of Israel and for generations. It kind of became like a tradition. It became um, a holiday. It was based on an experience. They always talk about that. Even modern day Jews, they make sure they talk about um, the, the deliverance from Egypt because it was to co commemorate their liberation. But it kind of became just a. I have to think it became just what they did. Maybe they didn't always know why they did it, but it consisted of a sacrifice, which modern-day Jews, they don't sacrifice anymore. But they do still make the meal of bitter herbs, and they have the unleavened bread, and they celebrate it for seven to eight days. They start off with a service where it's kind of like the Sabbath. They don't do any um, servile work, and they have a solemn assembly, and they end with that. But they, they totally get rid of leaven out of their house. So even now, they'll get rid of the leaven out of their house. Now, we may not think that that seems like such a big deal, but their main sta staples during that time, it was bread, wine, and oil. Bread was eaten with every meal, and it was such a vital part of the meal that the Hebrew word for bread actually refers to food in general. And they even have over a dozen words that mean bread. Bread was so important. In that time, it was 50 to 70% of their daily calorie intake. So if they went from this good, warm, toasty bread, which I can imagine if you had bread a lot, you probably really knew how to make good bread. And I love good bread. I can't, I can never do the keto thing. Because I love a good, warm slab of bread with butter and all that. But if you were used to having that good bread and then now all you have is this flat little cracker, you're going to notice. And I'm sure the kids were like, why are we eating this? I want the good stuff. And if it was a lot of your calorie intake, back in a time when everything you did was involved physical labor, they probably really felt it physically. Like if they went a whole week without this bread, they felt the lack of it. So 
they noticed when they didn't have any leaven. They noticed that there was no bread. So I have to wonder, and I just give me a little liberty here, but when as generations went on and people said, why, why are we eating this nasty, tasteless stuff? Why do we have this flat crust, whatever? Why are we doing this? I have to think that somebody said, well, it's because of this experience that we had. It's because there was a time when we were bound and we were enslaved, but we've been set free. There was a time when we saw all the water turn to blood. And if you can just imagine for a minute what that was really like, because not just, not just did the water turn to blood, but that had to smell. There had to be a lot of dead fish. So that stuck with them. They remembered this experience. They saw the frogs and they saw the lice everywhere. These were things that, according to my understanding, that the children of Israel did have to experience. Then when God separated and protected them from the other plagues, they still had probably saw and smelled the death of the cattle. They probably saw the hail and the fire coming down. They, of course, remember the night that the death angel came. And they could probably hear the cries and the screams of the Egyptians who lost so many people. They remembered. They had an experience. It was personal for them. So when we eat this, the Passover meal and we have this flat, tasteless bread, it's not just because God said, thou shalt not eat good bread for a week. It's not just because Moses said, I want you to just have no taste buds for a week and be miserable and feel physically weak. It's because they can say, God saved us. God protected us. God delivered us. We went through some things, but he brought us out. And that's the title of my message is today is A Message Without an Experience. So they had this experience that they needed to pass down to their, their, their children, to the next generation. And I feel like we are really good sometimes, and sometimes we're not good at passing down a message, but we don't always pass down the experience. Right. So when we, when we get up every day and we go to church and we pray for meals and we make decisions about what we do and what we don't do and all the different things, it's not just because... The pastor is teaching us, and we need teaching. And I, I don't negate that at all. I feel like there's been times we, through generations we haven't had enough teaching. But it's not just because he taught us. It's not just because mom or dad said so. But it's because of an experience that I had in an, at an altar. It's because of an experience you had at an altar. It's because of the time God spoke to you. It's because it was personal for you. It's because God came down and he took away some hurts. And he took away some fears. He took away brokenness. He gave us a new life. He gave us an abundant life. So it's not just that someone told us about Jesus, but it's because we've experienced Jesus. Amen. Now there's a difference between telling somebody about something and actually experiencing something. Now I'm going to confess something that's going to make me sound like a terrible, horrible person, but it is what it is. Up until about 20 years ago when I had Nicholas, um, I used to hear people request prayer for minor surgeries say, like, like, something I thought you couldn't die of, like, say, a kidney stone or a knee replacement or something. And I used to think, why are we praying for that? They're going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to sound really bad. <laughs> but I was like, that's no big deal. They'll be fine. Until 20 years ago when I had a scheduled C-section with Nicholas, and the night before I started panicking and realizing, oh my goodness, I'm about to go into a hospital and somebody's going to cut me open and I don't know for sure if they're going to know what they're doing, but if it's something bad happens. Like, I literally felt anxiety and panic, and I also felt really bad for all the people that I thought, how are you praying for that? You're going to be fine. <laughs> so, and I wasn't just a teenager. 20 years ago, I was 28, so it took me a while to get that one. But um, until I experienced it, I couldn't really appreciate that need. Um, I've heard people talk about empty nest syndrome and I used to think, why? That's so weird. Like, who cares? Your kids get older and they move on. That's what happens. I did it. Until my first child did that. Like, he got a wife. And he talks to her now more than he talks to me. Can you, can you imagine that? Like, <laughs> what's up? But um, I understand now. Because I've gone through it. I've experienced it. And that's where a lot of times I feel like that we can miss it. And, it's, and we have to remember that it's... Our responsibility as seasoned, as seasoned saints, sorry, that's a tongue twister, 
but to make sure that our little ones, and I see these little ones coming up, and I, I see my own children, and, and not just kids and young people, but anybody that comes into the church, any time that somebody is here for the first time, that they're not just hearing a message, but that they're also experiencing right. God. Right. And right. that no matter what happens to us, because church can get redundant, I know. Um, I mean, I've been doing it every Sunday for most of my life. Um, those of us on the music team, we get here at 8.30, and I know it's tough sometimes, especially if we've had a stressful music practice, and the music team say amen. <laughs> and then you got to put that behind you, like, okay, now we got to praise Jesus. Like, it's, it's really hard sometimes to just forget everything about us, but we have to remember that when the service starts, that it's so important that we're experiencing God. And not just for ourselves, but for these little kids coming up. And for every time there's a visitor. And even if they experience Pentecost and they walk out the door and think it, thinking those people are nuts, crazy, oh well, they experienced it. <laughs> they can say, say they experienced it. And we've got to make sure that that happens. I um, have a story about my dad. Um, and you guys, I think most of you know my dad. He's loud and um, fun and just he is who he is. But he... When he really is excited at worshiping, he's a walks, kind of walks around the church. He does, he's not a runner, so he's a walker. But um, when you know he's really excited, he gets a hanky, and away he's a hanky. And I don't know if any, any of you have been around Pentecost enough to see people do some hanky waving, but that's my dad. And so a few years ago, he was telling me, and my mom was telling me that I don't know what the service was, but he got out and he was waving his hanky. And after church, a guy who's probably about my age um, said to my dad, he said, oh, Brother Ross, that was so neat to see you. My, my son and I really appreciate seeing you getting out there and worshiping like that. And my dad was like, well, Jeff, your son needs to see you doing that. <laughs> like, right. you know, they need to see it. They, our kids need to see us yes. experiencing Jesus yeah. and feeling Jesus because that's, that is, I believe, one of the key things that's going to help them yeah. make it is to have their own experiences. I've been speaking with um, the hyphen on Wednesday night about altars and talked about some of the altars that Abraham built and how even there was a time Abraham went back to an altar. And so we've got to have our own experiences, make sure that every person that comes in has their own experiences, their own altar moments. Because I personally want to experience God every time I'm here. I don't want to just hear about God. I don't want to just read about Oh, he heals people. He delivers people. But I want to be able to say, I remember a time that I was sick and he healed me. I remember when I was bound by depression and anxiety and he delivered me. I want to experience it for myself. And I think it's really cool in the Old Testament when you read, especially in the Psalms, when they talk about the deliverance from Egypt. And it's generations later, but have you ever noticed that they can talk about it like they were there? But they, they did a really great job of passing that down. And I want to challenge all of us that even if you were raised in the church, start thanking God not just for your experience, but start thanking God for, like, me. I'm thankful that there was a lady who witnessed to my mom. Yes. I'm thankful for my mom's experience. Not, if, right. So whoever brought you into the church, I'm thankful that that person right. taught me Bible study. And I'm thankful for their salvation because that's what helps get me here. Right. So think about those experiences. And then um, just a few examples of every time in the Bible that there were ex there were messages from God, but there was also an experience that went along with it. Um, Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, he saw the angel, and then he couldn't speak. And I'm sure people were like, John, what's wrong with you? Because he could talk for nine months. And how many women that have ever been pregnant thinks that would have been awesome if you're like, it's not old enough. <laughs> Sorry, that would have been kind of a bit of But there was probably some people like, John, what's wrong? Why can't you talk? Jacob, when he wrestled with the angel, and then the rest of his life, he walked with the limp. What's wrong with you, Jacob? Why are you walking funny? Saul, who became Paul on the road to Damascus, he had a message from Jesus, struck him down, and then he was blind for several days. I'm sure, especially the guys that were with him, Paul, why can't you see what's wrong with you? happen. And then, of course, the story that we love to hear and that we're going to be celebrating in a couple weeks is when Jesus himself gave a message and said, go Terry, in Jerusalem. And along with that message came an experience, the baptism, yes. the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And people were asking questions. What are they saying up there? What, why are they talking to my language? 
what's going on. Because when you've had an experience with God, people will talk. People will ask questions. And that's what we want. Right. We right. want people to talk. We want people to ask questions. Yeah. Right. And then one of the final examples that I just want to share um, is about Samson. And I was a little nervous a couple Wednesday nights ago because I thought, Pastor is going to take what I want to say. He's going to say it. I don't want him to. But he did it. So, But in Judges chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. It says, And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. So, Samson's mother couldn't have children. And then an angel of the Lord one day appeared to her. That will stick with you. And not only did the angel of the Lord appear to her once, but the angel of the Lord actually appeared to her twice, the second time with her and her husband, and gave her a message and said, this child is going to have to follow after the Nazarite vow from birth to life. And the Nazarite vow was usually just for a small amount of time. I don't know why, that's one of those questions we can ask God when we're in heaven, why did Samson have to do it his whole life? Um, but it was, it was so much of part of who he was going to be, she even had to refrain from some things while she was pregnant. So he was not supposed to have any razor on his head, he was supposed to let his hair grow, he was supposed to have nothing from the mind, so not any grapes, not raisins, nothing like that. He wasn't supposed to go near a dead body. So she had this message, she had this experience, and then she had this message that she had to pass down to Samson. And Samson, for a while, he followed the message, but then slowly he compromised. Again, another question, I find it interesting, why was it that it was when the hair was cut that he lost his strength? Because when he, when he went near the dead body, he didn't lose his strength. Right. I don't know, it's a theological question for another day. But um, I just, I don't know if Samson did come near the mine too. I kind of think he probably did if he did everything else, I don't know. But he was slowly walking away from this message. But I feel like it might have been because it wasn't too personal. He didn't have that personal experience right. that his mom had had. His mom had had this, this miracle and this personal conversation with the angel of the Lord, which we know was actually God in a bodily form. That will change you. That will stick with you. But all she could do was share that with Samson. So he went on through life, and unfortunately, he had to go through some betrayal. He had to go through physical pain. He got his eyes plucked out of his head, which I know that had to hurt. He became blind. Um, the work that he did in the prison, so he was in prison, but then the work he had to do in the prison was probably tiring and exhausting and humiliating because he was used to being this big, tough guy. But that experience helped change Samson. And unfortunately, human nature, most of us, we don't get it until... We go through something tough, but that's what happened with Samson. Um, he was living the message at first before he let Delilah cut his hair all off, but it was based on his mother's experience. And because of that, it was easier for him to walk away. But the Bible says in Judges 16, 22, while he was in that prison, howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. And verse 28 says, and Samson called unto the Lord. And I just want to stop right there. Samson began to have his own personal experience and his own real communion with God. And that's where everything changed. And he called out to God and he said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee, pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be once at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. So he now had a personal experience with God. It was no longer his mother's prayers. It was no longer a family tradition. It was no longer this Nazarite vow that a few people in his community followed after. It became something that was very real for him. It was very personal. He was experiencing God, finally. And verse 30 says, And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death for more than they which he slew in his life. So even though it took him all that time, he finally had his personal 
experience with God, and he was able to conquer more Philistines in that moment than he had his whole life. Because it was the experience that went along with the message that caused him to be so powerful. And that is what God has for each and every one of us, for each and every child, born and unborn. Got another one on the way. For every person who comes into this church, not just that they hear a message, but they experience a message. That it becomes so real to them that they know there's something to this. I, I've got something I can live off of. I've got something I can go back to. And as I was studying this part about Samson, I came across something that I never had no, I had never noticed before. And I specifically felt like it's for anyone who has had children who've walked away. And so I just want to share this. Verse 31, it says, Then his brethren, talking about Samson's brethren, and all the house of his father came down. And they took him, and they brought him up, and they buried him between Zorah and Eshtael, in the burying place of Manoah and his father. So they came back and took his body back to Zorah. And then I noticed back at the beginning of the story in Judges 13, verses 24 and 25, it says, And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move at him, at times, in the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtel. So there was a time there at the beginning of his life where the Spirit of the Lord had begun to move on Samson. And then there was a time, a long time, where he was away and went through a lot of stuff. But at the very end, and even though in the story it was his death, at the end he ended up right back where he started, where the Spirit of the Lord moved on him. So I want to tell you, and I believe this with all my heart, do not quit praying, don't quit believing, because... No matter how many things they've got to go through, God can bring them all the way back to where the Spirit first fell, fell upon them, where they first heard the word. It can happen, happen for Samson. It can happen for anyone, anyone who's walked away, anyone who's heard the word, but they're not for sure. It's not too late. It's never too late. He went back. Samson went back to what he knew, and it may have literally been the very last of his life, the end of his life, his death, but he made it. He made it. He made it. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. And on, on that note about the importance of the experience and what our pastor is going to teach us about the importance of the message, and we need the teaching and we need the experience, we also need to remember, and this is where it hits home for me personally, is that it only takes one generation to lose the message. Judges chapter 2, verse 19 says, And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned to corrupting themselves more than their fathers, and following other gods to serve them, to bow down unto them. It happened all the time in the Old Testament. They would get a judge, and then things would go good, and then they would walk away from God, and they turned to the world, and then they'd fall out, and it was bad, and then a new judge would come. But it never ceases to amaze me that it didn't matter how much God did for one generation, the next generation could totally lose that. And I say it's personal for us because I see it personally in our family. I see family members that we pray for, that their parents know about the Holy Ghost. They felt the Holy Ghost. They've heard the word. But their kids know nothing about it. And that breaks my heart because their kids need it. And it's so important that we make sure that it gets in every fiber of our being, Amen. from the youngest, yes. from the little ones that are getting it in toddler class, and even though it may just be a little bit of repetition and a craft and a lot of fun times, all the way up until we die our last, or breathe our last breath, that we have this message and this experience that it's in us and that we carry it on, that we not just get it, but that we keep it, and that every generation gets it and keeps it, because I don't want my kids to walk away. I don't want my grandkids to walk away. And I encourage you, pray for your kids. Pray for your grandkids, even if you don't have them yet. Pray for your great-grandchildren. Just pray that every generation will keep this and will walk in this. Because I can tell you from experience that this is the best life. Right. It truly, truly is. doesn't mean it hasn't had trials and it hasn't had tough times. doesn't mean that I've always got it right. But there is so much that the Lord has done for me, and not because of me, but because of his goodness, but because of the experience that I had one day, 
because the experience that my parents had, the experience that my great grandmother, who I never knew, had. She was actually baptized by G.T. Haywood because she used to be um, Trinitarian and she received the oneness and was like, I get to get baptized in Jesus' name. I'm thankful for that experience. I'm thankful for the people who share with them who the experiences they have because this is where it's at. Right. Not because we're so good, but because God is so good. Yeah. And his ex the experience that we have in walking and living for God is like no other. We hear that term a lot. Oh, that's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But with God, it's a lifetime experience. Yes, yes. It just gets, Sister Thelma Sister said it to me the other day, it gets sweeter and sweeter, better and better after we get the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah. It just, it does, it gets better. And I truly pray and challenge us all to make sure that we're not just hearing the message, but we're experiencing the message. And that our kids and every person, and I feel like I keep saying this, but I feel it so, so strongly that I want them to experience God. And sometimes that's heartbreaking and and all honesty, because you can know people who experience God and then they still walk away. And you're like, I thought if they could just feel what I felt, and then they'd be convinced. And sometimes that doesn't always happen, but I'm not going to stop experiencing God. And I don't want you to stop experiencing God. And I want Him to move. I want every time that we come in this place, I want His glory and His presence to be here because. Living for Him is the best. It truly, truly is. And I'm so thankful for the goodness of the Lord. And I don't want this just to be what my mom did or what Pastor said. But I want this to be because it's part of who I am. Because it's what God did for me. And because I, I felt Him and I've seen Him work and move. And God has that for you. And i just like us to pray real quick that God would help us to always make sure we pass that down, the experience. But also, if you're here and you feel like you never really had that experience, I want to pray that you'll get that experience and that you'll have that moment. And even if it's not at church, if it's at night and you're laying down, if you can have that landmark experience with God, He'll meet you where you are. He's that kind of God. He's merciful and caring and loving. So let's just pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, I thank you, Jesus, that you've done so much for us. I'm thankful, Lord, for the experience that we do have with you, Lord God. I'm thankful for the day that you filled me with the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for the day that you allowed me to be baptized in your name and you washed my sins away. I'm thankful for every pastor, every minister, every saint of God, every evangelist, every person who ever spoke into my life or prayed for me. I'm thankful for the experiences I've had in you. I'm thankful for every message I've ever heard, every Bible study I've ever been taught. I'm thankful for that experience, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that you help me to continue to experience you, not just to read about you, not just to talk about you, not just to hear about you, but truly experience you and know you and to be connected with you, Lord, and to pass that on to others around me, that everyone that I'm around, that they'll feel you, Jesus, not because of me, but because, you, because of you, because of who you are. And I pray for every person, Lord, in this place that wants a deeper walk with you or wants to experience you in a new way, that you will meet them right where they are, Lord God. You know how to minister to each and every one of us on an individual basis. You know our hurts. You know our fears. You know our doubts. You know the things that we've carried. And I'm just praying in Jesus' name that you help us lay all that down and just rest in all that you are and in all that you that you want to do for us and to trust you, God, that you are going to take what we give you and you're going to break it and you're going to bless it and you're going to multiply it, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We praise you for all things, God. Help us to get our personal walk with you, our personal experience with you that no one can take away. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. Let's just worship him. Praise you, God. Bless your name, Jesus. I love you, Lord. You've been so good. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Your goodness and your mercy it endures forever. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise be to you, God. Bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
got so much for us. His experiences are, are out of this world experiences. And literally, one day we will have an out of this world experience. That's what we're living for. But I'm just um, thankful that you allowed me to talk to you guys today and to share with you from my heart. Because um, I love seeing the, the little ones coming up. And um, I don't know, maybe they were on my mind a lot. <laughs> but I'm just thinking, I, I want them, I want their generation to walk in truth. And I want the hyphen age generation to walk in truth. And I want us middle somethings, and I want us elders to walk in truth and hold fast to it because there's nothing like it. He is so good. So I'm going to turn this back over to our pastor. And I do have gifts for the mothers. so many times when you read their letters they mentioned that they had a joy when finding out that somebody was living for God and I'll never forget that a few years ago <clears throat> Brother Aaron Soto was preaching our family camp and I went up to him and I he was our he was a, a Bible college student with me and he was our student body president at, at IBC and um, he was happy to see me and to see that I was still living for God and in the ministry because so many people that I went to Bible college with are no longer even living for the Lord. And uh, I saw that there was a visible joy in him. Uh, and I felt the same joy that he was living for the Lord. And uh, that's, that's why we need to stay living for Jesus because we're holding other people up by, yeah. by walking for the Lord. Right. As we... As we carry on for, for Jesus, it's not just about our own souls. That's the primary thing. But understand that you're encouraging other people. And so there is that joy. Um, it's important that we be unified. But what's more important than unity is purity. That we stay holy unto God. Yeah. So that right. you're the only one that's going to stand before Jesus. <laughs> You're the only one that's going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ in an individual way. We're all going to stand before Him. And so we need to make sure that we connect our message with our experience for ourselves and that we stay pure before the Lord. And if we do that, God's going to take care of us. He's going to take care of us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, Brother uh, Brandon, Brother Sonny, would you come? We're going to give you the opportunity to give today. A couple of announcements. Remember our spring cleaning on the 22nd, 9 to noon, and uh, Pentecost Sunday the next day. Uh, we're going to have a special guest speaker. It was going to be Brother James Mars, our missionary to Bolivia, but we want to pray for him. He is sick, and uh, but uh, don't know who it's going to be, but it's going to be a missionary. And so I, I hear a lot of things at the very last minute from our blessed Brother Marcus. So, um, I have no idea who's coming, and I don't know when he's going to let me know. But I know that he'll probably let me know that Sunday morning that a missionary is going to show up. But I'm excited. Whoever's going to be is going to have a word of the Lord for us. Um, and uh, so I'm excited for Pentecost Sunday. Don't forget, there is a sign-up sheet for our 50 th 50s themed in honor of the 50th day after Passover, which is Pentecost. And so our 50s themed menu and uh, grab something, grab a couple things on there, and sign up for it. Also, want to announce that uh, they're not here today, but Alan and Gladys were married about three weeks ago here at the church, and uh, have a small family and friend ceremony. Um, that doesn't mean that you aren't friends, but it's just a <laughs> small ceremony. Um, and so we want to congratulate them when we see them. Amen. Brother Sonny, would you pray over this offering? Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to give today. We ask that you bless the Lord and multiply it as 
as you see fit. In Jesus' name.